Hello and welcome to the Opus Private Client Well Style Podcast. My name is Ivan Watanabe. I'll be your host along with my partner, Evan Wall. Evan, what's going on, man? How are you? Doing great. Just got back from a trip to my kid's school. We read some books and sang some songs. I'm ready to go. Gotta love that. Gotta love that. So um, I'm really excited today to bring on a college buddy of mine, a really successful sales entrepreneur, John Davis. What's going on, John? How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Evan, good I'm to see you. You too, John. Doing great, man. I'm really excited to have you on today. So um, John uh, right now is a sales director over at OneStream Software, also board member and founder of Shift Group. Um, we're going to get into both of the businesses and also, you know, has a number one Amazon bestselling book in US and Canada. So, dude, you're just out there crushing it. I'm very excited for you. Very proud of you. And, uh, and really wanted to have you on today, just given sort of all of the different transitions that people are having in their careers, to have you come on and share a little bit more about, you know, the title of your book or the purpose of your book, which is how to get a sales job. Um, so just kind of fill us in on, on what you're hearing these days, what, what the book's about, um, and, and we'll go from there. Sure. And thanks for having me. Uh, it's an honor. Long time listener, first time guest. So excited <laughs> to be here. So, I, I've never really uh, kind of described myself as a sales entrepreneur, but I like that. That's exactly what I am. Yvonne, you've known me for quite some time. Um, I'm pretty much an entrepreneur and a million different things. So I'm excited to talk about sales today because that's one of my favorite topics. Real quick, uh, just summary of who I am to kind of elaborate on that. I, I manage a sales team in Eastern Canada for OneStream Software. It's enterprise, mid-market, SMB size customers, all everything east of Winnipeg out to Newfoundland based in Toronto. And in my spare time, I'm an author of How to Get a Sales Job, which we're going to talk about. And I speak at universities about getting people into sales, entry-level sales, colleges and universities all over the U.S. and Canada. And I was a co-founder and a board member of Shift Group, which is also focused on entry-level sales. So that's going to kind of be the theme of how to get a sales job and why, I, why I'm passionate about that subject. Now, that being said, it's also a very timely episode, I guess, for you guys, because there are so many news headlines about tech layoffs. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys yep. have probably seen. We, we both have plenty of clients that uh, are between jobs or, or hiring and looking for, for new sales salespeople. Yeah. And, and that's my industry, technology <laughs> sales. I've been in it for a decade. Um, I think it's, it's, you know, part of the economy. We can get into the whole discussion of why the layoffs are happening. But if you're out there listening and you're thinking, you know, what do I do next or what do I do in my career? What I tell everybody is getting a sales job is getting into a career that you can control your own destiny. You know, layoffs aside, those happen at large organizations, but everybody who's been laid off recently in the tech world that's in sales, now they have a mission. They have to go find a sales job somewhere else. And that whole process is intense. It can be frustrating and you might not know where or how to start. So as somebody who came into technology sales from an entirely different industry with no background in sales, no background in software, no background in tech, I wrote the book on how to do it. And it starts pretty simple. If you were to, if you were to think, okay, how do I get a sales job today? Maybe I'm just graduating. Maybe I'm switching careers. Maybe I'm switching industries. Maybe I've just been recently laid off. How do I get a sales job? The number one you have to think, the number one thing you have to think about is Getting a sales job is the process of getting a sales job should be treated like an actual sale, right? Like managers, hiring managers out there, they're looking for people that are going to approach them with the same kind of correspondence, professionalism, and um, I want to call it aggressiveness, but assertiveness in their approach for people on their team that they want to um, rely on to sell for them. So I know that's a little bit of a convoluted way to intro it, but if you're out there looking for a sales job, you have to think, okay, my goal is to get a job. When I'm in sales or if I'm a sales rep, I'm supposed to sell a product and now you're trying to sell yourself. So that's a big part of the methodology in the book. 
John, John are you, or sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Evan. If you're from the perspective of the hiring individual, what are, what should they be looking for to identify this person could be successful in sales or, or the opposite, this person should not be looking into sales. Can you figure that out pretty quickly? What are, what are you looking for there? Yes, yeah, a great, great question. Um, when you're a hiring manager in sales, there's a number of different ways you get candidates put in front of you. The number one way is your HR team or a website at your company will direct resumes to your inbox and say, these people applied online, these people are in a system, take a look. That's kind of the easiest way to just get your name in front of a hiring manager. You apply online, mm -hmm. I'm sure they'll pepper an inbox with resumes. But as a sales manager, what I'm looking for is I don't want to just sift through who applied online. I look at that as, I don't want to call it lazy, but it's kind of the easy way out. I want to look for who is my top rep telling me to hire? Who in my network is saying, John, you have an opening at one stream? Why don't you talk to Phil? Why don't you talk to Lindsay? Or why don't you talk to Steven? They work at Adobe. You're, you love them. I know them. So I look for who in my network is telling me to hire these people. And then I also look at my team. Who on my team is telling me, hey, you should interview this person. And you look for people you trust and their opinion. And that's a first sign of, is the candidate doing the right things to get in front of you? Right? They could come directly to me or they could come through my network. But somebody who goes right through the website, I kind of keep those over to the side. Is that personal, it, personal references are far more important than you know, a resume, so to speak. Is that right? Personal references, Evan, but mainly their approach, their approach to how they got time with me, right? Because that's how they're going to get time with mm -hmm. our prospects, mm -hmm. right? That's how they're going to approach somebody they don't know the same way they approached me. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. got to kind of keep, keep a lookout for that. If you're a hiring manager, how are they approaching you? If, if they don't have a connection to you directly, let's say, you know, I want to work at one stream, but I don't know anybody that works there, right? And I saw online that there was a role, you know, how does a hiring manager feel about, you know, submitting it through the website, but then, you know, maybe they did the research to find out that John is one of the, the managers there and randomly LinkedIn messages you. Is that something, you know, you'd feel positive about? You'd feel like, well, this is kind of overreaching, you know, where's the boundary of, you know, if you don't have somebody that works there, but you definitely want to go, go, you know, sell for them, you know, how do, how do you, how do you balance that? I, I'd feel great about that. And I hope this isn't an invitation for people to just message me. <laughs> do it, do it. For jobs. Um, I actually hired somebody when I worked at Oracle, I hired somebody who cold called me. I couldn't believe that he cold called me. He found my number somehow. He called me, he said, Hey, I heard you had a hiring, uh, sorry, an open position at Oracle. I heard you're hiring. I want to introduce myself. And I was just taking a step back. And I was thinking, it doesn't matter if this person knows the product, the technology, or the space, or the industry. The fact that he was able to get in front of me so in such a like uh, professional way, and I liked him right off the bat, and he was courteous, and he had a good conversation style, and we had a nice talk. And we set up an interview. If you can do that successfully, you're you're ninety percent better off than the people who are just kind of coming around the corner. So I love so, a LinkedIn message. Yeah. So don't show up, you know, randomly at the at the sales manager's house, right? But well, you know, there's there's some, you know, <laughs> but uh, but maybe but maybe you're sending a LinkedIn message or or you're 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 caught you're finding a way to get in touch with them over the phone professionally. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, that and that's. That's what you're looking for with somebody that's aggressive in sales, right? You know, respectfully aggressive. Yeah, and I think aggressive gets a bad a bad rap, but like how simple is it to pick up the phone and, and make a call? Like, yeah, I, a lot of people are going to be uh, nervous about that, but like pick up a phone call, you know, pick up the phone, make a call, have a quick conversation. It's not that hard and it just goes way above and beyond what most people do. Yeah, and Evan and Yvonne, like what I'm telling you is, Yvonne, you're exactly right. Like I can also feel it when it's too much. When the person mm. is like way too intense, like, hey, I know you're hiring. Talk to me right now. I'm going to put to that's that's almost like, OK, hold on, pump the brakes a little bit. But at the same time, like you have to kind of appreciate that this is specifically for sales. Right. 
I, I don't know how much of the pursuit or approach to a new job applies to if you were going to be a financial analyst. Yeah. Right? If you're an accountant and you just got your CPA and you want to become a senior accountant, I don't think you're going to just LinkedIn message somebody who's the controller of a company and start peppering them. Like they're not going to like that because that's not what they're focused on. They're focused on your degrees, your background, your certifications, but in sales, it's the finer, the finer things in life they're focused on, right? Yeah. The people skills. Where, where do you think right now? So let's say you're getting laid off from a large tech company. Um, where do you think the opportunity lies for people in search of, of, of a sales job right now? Right now, I would say two answers to that. The first thing would be, I, I can't guarantee this, but I have been learning all about what's new in the industry, specifically in, in technology sales, but um, cybersecurity seems to be growing at a mm -hmm. very rapid pace. There's companies out there with a lot of funding, not a lot of people, and they're looking for talented people to come in and start broadcasting the message of cybersecurity. So I, I see that as a very fast growing industry um, or space within technology. And then outside of that is look at kind of the other industries as a whole, right? Like if you just kind of look at, okay, how is med device, how is that as an industry? How is financial services doing right now? And there's sales jobs available at pretty much every company. Mm -hmm. You just have to figure out which companies, which industries are moving forward and which ones are kind of tightening up, tightening up right now. Um, I don't have a magic bullet. I don't have like, hey, go to this company, they're hiring, right? There's a lot of tools out there. I see more and more people, especially on LinkedIn, trying to assist with the search and starting websites like, you know, this company's hiring or there's open jobs here. There's a lot of resources out on the web. I would recommend starting with your, your network, um, definitely starting with websites related to searches. And I highly, highly recommend getting a sales recruiter. I think it's a phenomenal thing to do. And I mean, that might be a good transition into what we're talking about with shift, but yeah, having somebody else work with you and guide you can, can put you further along than other candidates. Yeah. I think that's a good segue. I mean, fill us in sort of shift group, you know, what it is, how it's been helping people, why, why, you know, what makes it a little bit different than some of the other, um, some of the other companies that are out there. Sure. So Shift Group is a sales recruiting agency founded by one of our other college roommates or friends, J.R. Butler. Um, J.R. is the CEO of Shift Group, and he and I started years ago talking about this concept of helping athletes, whether they're student athletes, retired athletes, professional athletes, semi-professional athletes, or anybody associated with athletics in general that's trying to shift away from sports into entry-level sales. The concept kind of started, well, definitely started with JR's younger brother, Bobby Butler, who played in the NHL and the AHL and shifted into a sales role after his retirement. So that's, that's kind of how that company started. But what we identified at Shift Group is there's a major gap with athletes, whether it's because of leagues, organizations, or just their uh, understanding of the job market. When an athlete retires or stops playing division one sports or full-time um, football, 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 right? Somebody retires at 25 from the NFL, they're 25 years old. What mm -hmm. do they need to do? You know, not everybody makes Alex Ovechkin money, right? Not yeah. everybody's retiring with a hundred million dollars. There's NHL players who retire at 25 that have been making 200 to $500,000 for a few years, they're 25. They're not gonna survive off their savings over the next 30 years. So they're looking for careers. So Shift Group trains, recruits, and teaches athletes how to do the basics, the blocking and tackling of an entry level sales job. Yeah, and for, for those that are sort of transitioning or shifting, even if you had a different career, I sort of liken it the same, right? It's, you know, you're, you're getting into an industry that you may not necessarily know anything about. Um, what, what, what makes like the, the athlete 
the best or, or, or a really attractive candidate for a sales job? I mean, I, I think I have a pretty good understanding, but you know, just elaborate a little bit more about, you know, why an athlete would be a really attractive sales, uh, salesperson. So great, great question. I think, um, when I think of an athlete, I think of somebody in general is somebody who's very athletic, which means they're dynamic, right? So some of these athletes, famous athletes, you know, like, uh, Tom Brady, for example, you know, he played baseball as well. He's not mm -hmm. just a football player. He's, he's great at being a quarterback, but a lot of athletes can play different sports and do different things very successfully. A lot of it is their coachability, the competitiveness, and the ability to follow directions. That's like a hiring manager's dream in sales. A, a big misconception in technology sales is that the person joining the organization will understand the technology. It's almost like a catch 22. Like if you were to apply to Microsoft in that interview, if they say, so Evan, Microsoft, tell me all about our products. There's 10,000 different products and services mm -hmm. at Microsoft. You're not supposed to know it all. Mm -hmm. Athletes can come in, be trained on, hey, you're going to be on this team. Your role is this. Your goal is this. You're going to compete against these people. And this is your number and this is your quota. And they can compete on the sales front and then bring in the right technical people to assist them. So it's very team-oriented and coachability, competitiveness, and ability to follow directions is huge. Speaking of the the interview process, in person, virtual, like what what are you what are you sharing with your with your clients on you know best practices there and what they should be looking for? Well, a lot of uh, a lot of interviews today are virtual. Yeah, which is pretty intense if you ask me because when I was looking for a sales job, it was phone interviews. That was the big way to kind of screen candidates, and you don't have to. Um, look the part when you're taking a cell phone call, right? I, I, I get a lot of slack for my uh, big red beard, but uh, yeah, me on a Zoom call, I don't know how well I would do because it's just like, I kind of look like a criminal or something, but uh, no, I, <laughs> no I think, not a criminal, <laughs> lumberjack maybe, no. but not a lumberjack, criminal. <laughs> lumberjack. I'm not a criminal, yeah, no. But I think um, you have to take into account that when you're interviewing virtually, a lot of the, the little things matter. And that's a big part of my book. When you're interviewing in person or on the phone, the little things matter. How you greet someone, it matters, right? Like there's different ways to be on a screen and greet somebody poorly versus effectively. Um, backgrounds, you guys both have phenomenal backgrounds on your- uh, Thank you. On your walls here. My I had this color before Yvonne, by the way. <laughs> I thought you were in the same room. <laughs> no, but it's it's a real thing. Like my background is my kitchen. I live in a condo in Toronto. So, you know, being aware, I tell a lot of people looking for jobs, like have proper lighting, at least have a collared shirt on. In person, I'm telling you to wear a suit, do it up a little bit more. Um, so focus on kind of how you look, how you're presenting and how you're projecting that image to the hiring manager, because a good hiring manager is going to think, could I put this person or this screen in front of our top customers? That's yeah. what everybody's thinking. Nobody's saying it, but that in a sales evaluation, mm -hmm. interview, mm -hmm. they're thinking, is this person presentable? So that'll but, get you further. Yeah. And what about in person now after the interview and, you know, hired or, or maybe even start during the interview process as well, uh, in in person versus virtual work at home like what are you seeing trends there are you suggesting like don't bring it up in the interview or you know if you do like you're going to be limiting your your you know the, the matches you'll get yeah that's a good good question and very uh Timely. very hot topic for people because yeah. they're always wondering do i do i bring it up about the office or not the office i'm seeing a lot of um hybrid models, which is kind of a cop out for that answer. But what I like to tell people is if you're interviewing with somebody virtually and you're, let's say I'm in Toronto interviewing for a job at Adobe in Toronto and I get on with the hiring manager, I'm going to use that virtual call to try and ask if I can meet them in person. Mm -hmm. 
I do much better in person than sitting in my kitchen. So that's, that's just one way to kind of break the ice. And when you get somebody in person, you can open up and ask them about the culture. And you might also hear from them and they say, whoa, 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 we don't meet in person. We're entirely virtual. Kind of have an answer there. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Okay. And, you know, I, I, I think as people start to evaluate the offers that they're getting, so now we've kind of talked a little bit about ways to, to sort of base the interview, you know, where you should be searching. Let's say they get some offers. You know, one of the things that I find some of my clients get really frustrated with their in sales position is how their comp gets structured, right? And the different things that they're like, okay, I thought I was going to be making X, but, you know, based off of the way they they've now changed my deal because I crushed it this year. And next year, the company's deciding to shift the way I get paid. And now I know I'm going to make 20% less if I make the same. So what, what are some of the different red flags or things that you can identify up front before you accept the job? And then as you go on, like, what are the things that you consistently see companies doing that you're like, that culture stinks on the way that they keep restructuring your, 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 your benchmarks? Great question. So it's very relevant to to my book, not to replug my book, but how to get a sales job. I I talk a little bit about it in the beginning of that book is that sales reps change jobs more than most people. Mm-hmm. And they change for many, many different reasons. But one of the main reasons that sales reps will quit or change jobs is their comp plan. Right? Their if comp plan. If, yeah, if your quota is, a, if you're a good sales rep, and your quota is a million dollars and everybody's quota on your team is a million dollars and no one's coming close to that. And you're really good and you know, you're a good salesperson. It's so easy to just look and go and interview at companies where they have people who are achieving their quota, mm. blowing past their quota. So a great question. And, and this is something you have to get uncomfortable with in an interview in a sales role is you have to talk about money. Mm-hmm. And if you can do it confidently and effectively and not sound like you just want to be paid a ton of money for not doing work, right? You, you got to do it professionally. You need to figure out what the quota is, what the average deal size is, what, how long the average sales cycle is, how many people on the team hit quota, how many people were below quota, how many people were below 50%, how many people were at 200%. Did you have anyone make a million dollars? What's your highest you know, salesperson paid? These are questions that they're almost, uh, it almost feels like aggressive to ask somebody that. But if you're interviewing for a sales role, you're probably interviewing with somebody like myself and I would have an answer to all those questions. Yeah. And I would appreciate the fact that you're trying to assess, can I make money here? Because it's sales. So don't be afraid to ask the difficult questions around comp and especially like achievement. How many people on your team achieved quota? That's, that's a big tell. And then Yvonne, to the second part of your question, some of the other practices that I've seen related to kind of what people are doing and it's, it's, it's a big topic right now. They're like, I don't want to make any assumptions here, but there's a lot of layoffs going on. And what historically has happened in certain industries is companies are raising the bar on how much they're going to sell, how much more annual revenue they're going to sell in subscriptions, how many more licenses they're going to sell and perpetual maintenance. And all these revenue targets are just increasing every year. It's a little pet peeve of mine because... Yvonne knows this, uh, you know, I am, I am a little bit out there, but I am kind of a nerd too. I did go to Holy Cross, shout out Holy Cross, <laughs> but a healthy business in, in the technology space should grow annually between I'd say seven and 9%. That's healthy. Right. But in today's world, the markets, they want to see 30% growth, right? They want to see something growing at 15%, 50%. And you have sometimes executives out there saying, we're going to grow the business by 39%. That's a great, great goal. When you're at $1 and you're raising it by 39%, that's awesome. But when you start to get more and more into, okay, now we have like 6,000 customers and we have 200 salespeople, it's hard to say, hey, 
this market is going to grow like it's been growing. And it's, and it's almost like a, um, you don't want to tell somebody, Hey, we're not going to grow that much anymore. We're going to kind of slow down and come to a normal steady growth. The market doesn't want to hear that. So there's a lot sure. of lofty goals. And as a sales rep, you can get kind of swept under the rug and crushed by that. If you're in the wrong yeah. spot. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that I've seen clients sort of shift to a different company, which is, you know, they, they see maybe one, one change of how they get comped based off of whether they hit their metrics or not, or they're rejiggering like the entire plan. But when they start to see that happen year after year after year, not just sort of elevated benchmarks, but more like the structure of their compensation and how deals get paid out, when they start to see that change year after year after year, sort of a red flag that like, they're just really trying to get us to sell more, pay us less. And they're, they keep changing how the actual deal gets, you know, paid out. Right. So I think that seems to be a red flag for folks and in, in causing, causing shifts for sure. Yeah. It's, and it's probably too, uh, too big picture to think about that as a sales rep, but it's really like a cash flow problem yeah. of your company. They don't want to pay sales reps. They change the compensation plan to kind of fit with how they want to do the payouts. And yeah, it, it yeah. definitely tightens up. I can I can think of a client that a uh, sales role moved to Amazon and took a cut on base salary because of the structure of you stay there for I think it was four years you get all this vested stock and so it's a you know when you take that into account then you know he's going to be earning more money but he's got to stick it out for at least four years and you know hopefully he has some some good earning years in there. Yeah, that's definitely uh, in the tech space. There's definitely like you throw in equity now. And that's mm -hmm. another factor. So, um, Yvonne, I think you and I were talking about this a few months back, but if you're, if you're out there looking for a sales role, you're going to face like the comp structure. What's my on target earnings? What's the base? Like Evan, you're saying, what's the base salary versus the commission structure? Um, when do they pay it out? Some people pay commissions once a quarter. Some people pay it every two weeks. Some people pay it the next day. Um, and then there's the equity portion and, Equity is always, I know on your your show, it's definitely a topic of interest. I can't tell you how many new salespeople I meet and they're like, I just started at this company and they gave me tons and tons of equity. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. And it's like, it's so much equity. Like we're going to go public and make so much money. And I'm like, what's the name of your company? And they're like, it's uh, scalablezooanimals.com. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> They're like, we're like the Uber for the zoo. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's awesome. You guys are, you know. Did you just make that up off the top of your head? That's a good I did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> that was excellent. That was excellent. But there so, are so John many companies that aren't, they're not going to, they're not going to get to that, you know, liquidity event that everybody dreams of. So you got to kind of be careful with, with that when you're looking at companies too. Absolutely. John, as we kind of wrap up here, you know, are there any things that you want to make sure that the listening audience really takes away from our conversation and in, in sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 the sales job search? Sure. I think it's a, it's a great way to stay competitive being in a sales role because what I sold when I worked at Oracle 10 years ago, what I sold at Oracle, it's no longer a technology. It's evolved. It's changed. They put it in the cloud. They changed it six times. They don't sell that stuff anymore, right? If I can become a salesperson, if a listener can become a salesperson and learn how to sell real estate or technology or cars or CPG, consumer products or financial services, if you can learn that skill, you can be much more dynamic throughout your career and you can also pivot to different industries later on in life or find different roles or different businesses that you can jump into and you know the sales part of it you can add value right away so i think it's a it's a great career you know i listen to your show and i'll add that like it's a great way to also make a lot of money and then put your money to work for you so later on you you don't have to be a commissioned sales rep your whole career there you go. get some of that compound interest exactly yeah, exactly that Love that. Well, John, appreciate you, man. So, so how to get a sales job is the name of the book. Where can everybody look for this book? Again, it's number one uh, on Amazon sales. 
uh, UK and and uh, and Canada. But is that the only place for for folks to find out more about you in the book, or where else can they can they download it? So I'd check out uh, howtogetasalesjob.com. That's my website. It has reviews on there and some of the basics of what you'll find. Um, it's available on Kindle. It's available on uh, paperback, both on Amazon. And then I just had somebody, uh, an entrepreneur himself, put it on Audible, which he approached me, side story, and said, if you give me $500, I'll read your book and put it on Audible. And I said, deal. And I've had a huge uptick in my sales just on Audible. So that's a oh, that's cool. another outlet, outlet I wasn't expecting. Awesome, man. Well, uh, we'll love that. I really appreciate it. For the listening audience, for the first five people to reach out either through LinkedIn or email me directly or Evan directly, uh, we'll send you a copy of John's book. Um, and, and anyone else who wants to get a hold of it, again, John mentioned on, on Amazon and on his website. So, uh, John, listen, man, I appreciate the conversation. I know it was super valuable for the listening audience and, uh, and we'll, we'll get a chance to touch soon. Thank you guys. And I love the show. I love what you're doing. Keep it up. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Appreciate Thanks, it. John. And for you, again, the listening audience, make sure to reach out to us. First five people get a copy of John's book. Um, and please click subscribe below so that you can be notified when we release another podcast episode on all the different channels that you can get our podcast on. All right. Talk soon. Be well, guys. Thank you.